Well, hello, congregation, family and friends, and Bereans. I pray that all is well with you. Thank you for joining me for this Sunday broadcast. This is a message that I make no apologies for up front. This is a message that may upset some people. It may turn some people off. It may infuriate you. But again, I make no apologies for it because I must preach what the Holy Spirit has given me to preach. Today, we're going to talk about woe. Not as the world understands woe, but what does God mean when we talk about the word woe. We're going to be in Isaiah chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, and you should, or your device, however you look at Scripture, I invite you to turn to Isaiah chapter 5. We're going to be looking at a section, of course, not the entire section, but I encourage you, as I always do, to read the entire section to get the full context of everything. We're going to be looking at a section of Isaiah 5 that is essentially known as the woes to the wicked. Woes to the wicked. There are six woes there. So before we go any further, we're going to discover and we're going to talk about exactly what God means when he says woe. Now, woe in our society and our dictionaries can mean a few different things. Woe can mean whoa, whoa, whoa like a surprise, whoa. Woe can also be slow down, slow down, whoa, back off, you're going too fast, you're throwing too much at me, whoa. But that, uh, they're spelled W-H-O-A. When God spells woe, it's W-O-E. And whenever we see in the Old Testament or the New Testament, because Jesus had a number of woes that he talked to the Pharisees and the scribes about, whenever we see the word woe, this is always a warning. It's never anything good. It's a warning from God. It's a lesson we need to learn. Very often, it's a rebuke. That's what we're going to look at today. These are rebukes. And when we look at this section of Isaiah 5, and we look at these six woes, and by the way, today we'll be looking at woe number 4 and woe number 5. If you have your Bibles open, you can turn right to Isaiah 20. We'll be looking at Isaiah 20 and 21 today. But when you see the word woe, you should underline it, highlight it in your Bible. It's like a flashing red light. It is a red flag. It is arrows pointing to it. It's God saying to us, don't you dare miss this. Now, even though we're looking at Isaiah and he was around approximately 800 years before Jesus came to earth, this is just as relevant. You're going to see that. This is just as relevant to the day that we're living in right now, the society and the world we're living in right now. Because after all, the Bible is alive, it's breathing, and it's just as relevant today as it was the day it was written. And so in the midst of these six woes, and I encourage you to read all six woes, we're going to look at woe number four first, and it's in Isaiah chapter 5, beginning in verse 20. This is the word of God. This is God's word, and it says this, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitutes darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitutes bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. That is a major woe. That is God saying, you better pay attention, you better listen. Now, when we analyze and, and look at verse 20 very carefully, we see that God is essentially saying the same thing, but he's saying it three different ways. And there is a biblical rule that if God says something once, it's important. If he says it more than once, it is super important and we can't miss it. And so I want to go back and look at this verse again, and then I want you to see, I want you to see honestly with open eyes, an open heart, an open mind, if you see these things happening in our society today and in our world today. God says this, woe, warning, woe to those, all of those who call evil good and good evil. I could preach just on that one sentence alone for the next hour. How many examples do I need to give you? We live in a world, but we live in a society that has made evil things seem good and good things seem evil. When you do things like kicking God out of school and taking prayer out of school and banning Bibles from being in school, 
and you have churches that are apostate and you have pastors that are in the pulpit who are carrying on with church members or they're not preaching the true word of God and you see churches are falling apart. The church is supposed to be the light of the world. The true believers are supposed to stand for what is right. And yet, how often do we see the church falling into the abyss, falling into the mire of the world, and we start compromising, we start calling what is evil, good, and we start calling what's good, evil. And yes, if I get a little excited in this message, it's because I'm indignant about what's happening in the church. This is the Word of God. This does not change. Jesus said to us, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. That's the book here. What God says goes. What God says is the truth. Now, you can accept it, or you can deny it, or you can close the book and never pay attention to it again. But Jesus is telling us, God is telling us that woe to all of those who say evil is good and good is evil. And then he looks at the next phrase. We see who substitute, or we can also use the word exchange, who exchange darkness for light. Does the Bible not tell us that light and darkness do not match? You can't have light where there is darkness. And God is light and Satan is darkness. We live in a world that is separated into two kingdoms. One is the kingdom of God. That's the kingdom of light. The other one is the kingdom of Satan. That's the kingdom of darkness. And you can have light with darkness. Corinthians tells us what fellowship does light have with darkness. Well, when you live in a compromised, sin-cursed, fallen world, when you live in a world where people say evil is good and good is evil, then naturally what's going to follow is those things that are darkness, those things that are sinful, those things that are against the word of God are suddenly going to be lifted up into the light. And those things that are supposed to be light, supposed to be pure, supposed to be righteous, get pushed down and we look just like the world. The church looks like the world. Now, I am not advocating for one certain kind of church and one certain kind of worship. I'm certainly broad-minded enough to know that you can have different worship styles, different preaching styles, different makeups of congregations. What I'm talking about is the people of God, you and I, that compromise with the world, that fall into the world, that refuse to take a stand based on what the Word of God says. There's too many of us around that are doing that. And we are being rebuked by Almighty God today in this message when we read, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light, who also substitute bitter for sweet. I encourage you all, do a word study. Whenever you see the word bitter or bitterness, it very frequently means anger frustration, disappointment. And if we're substituting bitter for sweet, and when you look at the word sweet, when you see passages like their sacrifice was a sweet aroma, it was a sweet savor in the Lord's nostrils, things that are supposed to be sweet, that are supposed to be good, supposed to be righteous. The Apostle Paul told us this in Philippians 4 verse 8. He said, whatever things are pure, whatever things are good, whatever things are of good report, whatever things are of holy, those are the things we focus on. That's the good. That's the light. That's the sweet. But we, we as a society, and particularly this country, we have taken the good and the light and the sweet, and we've turned it around into evil and darkness and bitterness. And we wind up hating one another. And we wind up killing one another. And we wind up putting laws in place that keep a certain person down and elevate another person. I wasn't sure if I was going to bring this up, but the Holy Spirit is telling me to do that. You know that if you've been following me for a while, you know that about six weeks ago, Crystal and I left the church that we were fellowshipping with. We were members of a church. Without going into detail, and some of you know because I've explained this to you behind the scenes, but to just tell you overall what happened. Because of our stand against systemic racism, 
against social injustices, against all of the things that are happening to people of color, because we took a stand, an active stand, a vocal stand, we fell out of fellowship with the church that we were part of. And through some dialogue, we could not come to an understanding. And so I had no choice but to resign my pastorship, lose a salary, and we walked away. And we did that because we stood for what was good and what was right and what was light and what was sweet. If you want to be in denial that there is no systemic racism, if you have not been woke yet, like I have been woke and many others have been woke, if you have not woken up to these facts, I invite you like I do to investigate, investigate what is really happening. Investigate the laws that have been put into place. Investigate the practices that have been put into place that keep a certain culture, a certain person of color down that elevates another person. And if you're not ready to hear that truth, you're not ready to hear this message and you're not ready to hear this verse that talks about that we have created evil as good and good as evil. Could I get on here and talk about the hot button issues that only seem to matter? We could talk about abortion. We could talk about homosexuality. We could talk about same sex marriage. We could talk about all of that. What I hear is a lot of talk about abortion, but I don't hear a lot of talk about the souls that are already here and what we're doing to get them saved and to help them see the kingdom of God. That's what I'm not hearing. I hear too many fluff messages. I hear too many messages of compromise. I see too many verses and too many scriptures taken out of context. And suddenly we're getting all of these muddled kind of gospel messages. There is one gospel. It's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the gospel that he preached. And let me tell you, if you haven't read the gospels recently, I encourage you to go back and read those gospels and you'll see how often Jesus stood against social injustice, against class warfare, against pitting one person against another. It was Jesus that went into Samaria and spoke to the woman at the well in John chapter 4. It was Jesus that went into areas where his apostles were appalled. They were shocked that he was talking and doing the things that he was doing. And each time the apostles would rebuke someone that was hanging around Jesus, he would turn around and tell them, stop doing that, bring them to me. Jesus was a people person. Jesus was involved in people's lives. He didn't go around judging people. Now, did he rebuke the Pharisees and the scribes? Oh, yes, he sure did. All you have to do is read through the Gospels and read every time he said a woe to them. It was because they were self-righteous. They were above everyone else. They thought they were better than everyone else. They thought they knew better. They were smug. They were blind. They were deaf. They didn't want to hear the truth. They hated Jesus. They hated everything he stood for. And can I tell you that in this world today, in this society today, there are many modern-day Pharisees walking around. Many modern-day Pharisees. You think you know something. You think you got it all right. But what you're not doing is looking and asking God for clarification, for enlightenment. That's what you're not doing. You're staying in your own little box. Here's my hot-button issues. This is what I want to talk about, and that's all I want to talk about. And if you bring something else, something different, something new, something that's offensive, well, we no longer have fellowship. We left the church because we fell out of fellowship with the church we were in. We were no longer in agreement. We no longer held the same understandings, the same beliefs. We left. We had no choice but to leave. I would have done the same thing if the decision was today. We made the right choice. We stood. We took a position. We're not the only ones to go through these movements and to go through these learning experiences where suddenly you find yourself on the outside. We're not alone in that. There are many of you that are fighting for what's right. You're not accepting evil for good and good for evil. You're not accepting darkness for light. If God says it, 
And you and I, if we profess to be true believers, if you and I are true believers, if Jesus is our Lord and Savior, then this is our guidebook. This is our rule book. This is what we live by. This is what we die by. And if somebody comes along and says it's not true, or they twist the scripture, or they say something that you know is not in there, or they're picking and choosing what they want to preach on and what they don't, that is a woe. That is turning evil into good and good into evil and accepting darkness over light. Who is the prince of the air, the prince of this world? Of course, it's Satan. But you and I also know that Satan is defeated. He's done for. And it's a matter of time when Jesus comes back, Satan will be bound forevermore. But right now, God has allowed him to roam to and fro all around the earth. That doesn't mean we have to fall in with it. Doesn't mean that we have to pick up everything that people say or what we hear preached. Why do you think I constantly tell you to be Bereans? Even with this message today, you must be a Berean. You must search the scriptures for yourself to make sure that what you're hearing is true. Look around you. Look around you and see what's happening. Look at the laws that are made, and I could go through a whole list of them, but I'm not getting political here. Just a couple of them. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer. We have a situation right now, and I wasn't going to share this, but I, I have a situation right now where I have a medical condition that needs attention. And because I don't have a certain kind of insurance, because I don't have a rich man's insurance, I'm having trouble finding a doctor that will treat me for my medical problem because I don't have the right kind of insurance. Woe to those that call evil good and good evil, that replace darkness, light with darkness. Because we live in a society that cares more about money, that cares more about the love of money and power and prestige, I have to search, like many of you, for basic medical care when it should be available to all of us. But because we have laws, because we have people in power, because some people are staying down and being oppressed no matter what, I have to continue a search for a medical doctor, for a medical condition that I have. And because I switched insurances, I now may not be able to get treated. Woe to those who replace light with darkness and who replace sweet with bitter. Am I talking to anyone today? Am I talking to myself today? Am I the only one that's incensed about this, that's upset about this, that God has clearly said, we, in 2020, have fallen into this trap where we justify things. And we put people in power and we make laws and rules that only a certain type of person is going to succeed and other people are going to be squashed down and it's so insidious and it's everywhere God is warning us when God says whoa he means whoa we better pay attention because you and I all of us are going to be held accountable for this now I want to go to the next whoa verse 21 because this fits in with verse 20. Verse 21. Here's the next woe that God's warning us about. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Are we talking pride here? Can you see some pride in there? Can you see some people? Maybe yourself. Maybe I. I've been prideful at times. I've said and done things that I shouldn't have done. Was I wise in my own eyes? When we decide that we know better than God, when we decide that we can fix problems better than God, and we start leaving God out of the equation, we stop praying, we stop going to church, we stop reading the Word, we start allowing television and podcasts and all kinds of other things to infiltrate our thinking. When we get so caught up that we're either left-wing or right-wing, we're not God-wing. We're left or we're right. We're liberal or we're conservative, and we fight against one another. We're either white or we're black or we're Latino. Why are we putting all these labels on ourselves? And why do we think we are so clever in our own sight 
and we're so wise in our own eyes. Are you serious? Do you think if God looked down right now, and he is, do you think he would be happy with you? Do you think he would be happy with me? How are we conducting ourselves? Do we think that our egos are big enough to solve all the problems? We go through this pandemic and we're still going through COVID-19. Now, I'm not privy to all the broadcasts, but I haven't heard a whole lot of people talk about God, talk a lot about science, talk a lot about vaccines, talk a lot about medicine, talk a lot about all those things that we have to do, washing our hands and wear masks. All of that is great. What I don't hear is what God thinks about all this and what God is doing about all this. And maybe we, as the church, as the true church, the bride of Christ, maybe we ought to be on our knees begging God to intervene. Maybe we should be seeking God and repenting for all of these sins and all of this racism and all of this hatred and all of these things that we do to one another instead of being in rebellion and this person over here decides they don't want to wear a mask and suddenly they come down infected and meanwhile they've been around 50 people and now they get infected. I am sick and tired of hearing people say this thing is a hoax. Okay? Crystal and I know people who are dead and in the ground from this hoax. It's not a hoax, folks. It's a pandemic. And we think we're so clever. We think we're so wise in our own eyes and we have the intellect and we can figure everything out and yet we're not invoking God. We're not asking God into this situation. We've left God out because we've replaced good, which is God, with evil, which is the world. We've replaced light which is God. Jesus said he's the light of the world. You see a lot of light around? I don't. What I do see is a whole lot of darkness, a whole lot of hatred, murders, and all kinds of things that's happening in this world. And you and I, listen, you and I as true believers, and I'm talking to the true believers now, I am talking to the brothers and sisters in Christ. If you're not doing your part, if you are not praying, if you are not in your scriptures, if you are not participating in something, if you're allowing all of this to happen and it's going right by you, then you are part of the problem. You are part of the blindness. You are part of what's bringing evil and kicking out the good. You're bringing the darkness and kicking out the light. You're bringing in the bitterness and you're kicking out the sweet. Where do you stand? You've got to draw a line somewhere. You've got to put your line down in the sand and say, this is what I'm standing on. This is where I'm going. This is where God is leading me. That's what we've done here at this ministry and in this house. That's what we've done. And we're going to continue doing it. And yes, we make enemies. And yes, people don't like us. And yes, I'm accused of being a loud mouth and being too bold and saying things that upset people. I told you in the beginning, I make no apologies for this. I don't care. Because these things have to be said. If you think, and I think, that we're clever in our own eyes and we're wise in our own sight and we think that we've got everything figured out, we've got a rude awakening coming. Because for all of our smarts, for all of our science, for all of our medicine, we still mistreat people. We still have people dying every day because they can't get medical care. We still have people dying because there's people that are homeless and are hungry or they're mentally ill. What does that say about us? Have we replaced good with evil? That's pretty much self-explanatory, hasn't it? And until things change, until systems change, until everything changes, we tear it all down and start it all over again. Until that happens, we're not going to see a whole lot of change. And there's only one place we can go that can actually make this happen. No, you don't go to Congress. You go to Almighty God. We go to Almighty God on our knees and we pray and we beseech God to intervene. When's the last time you did that? When is the last time you actually asked and beseeched and pleaded with God to intercede? Not just for your own personal pleasures, not just for your own set of wishes, but for society, for the church. When the church starts looking like the world and you can't tell a godly 
Holy Spirit-led sermon from fluff, from a feel-good, motivational message. When those kind of preachers have 40,000 people in the audience, and the guy who's struggling to preach faithfully to the Word of God has six people, something's wrong. We've replaced evil instead of good, and we brought darkness in. And you know what? Satan has had a field day with this. Between the pandemic, between all this racism that's happening, between all the awareness that's happening, the protests and everything else, Satan is having a field day because he sees all of the destruction. He sees all of the hatred. He sees the murders. He sees all that, and he is having fun because Satan has one goal, and that is to take people to hell with him when it's all over. That's his only goal. He's a soul collector. That's what he wants. He wants your soul. And so when Isaiah tells us, woe to all of us, to those, Thomas first, and then you next. When Isaiah tells us, woe to those who call evil good. We're calling Satan good. We're calling darkness good. We're calling bitterness good. So it's good to be angry. It's good to be racist. It's good to be hated. It's good to hate other people. It's good to put yourself above someone else because that's what he's saying here. All of that. And if you and I have fallen into that trap and you and I are guilty of this, we need to be on our knees today, right now, without another minute, today, repenting before God. Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for those times that I didn't see your glory. I saw the world's. Forgive me, Lord, for those times that I put myself first and you second. Forgive me, Lord, for those times that I didn't love my fellow man. You created all of us in God's image. So why are certain people of color treated differently than other people? I, I could go on and on, but I respect your time. I just pray that this message has reached somebody. That this message has reached somebody. If this has reached you, if this meant something to you, even if this infuriated you, good, because I got a response. I encourage you to send this out and share this with other people. God told us in Isaiah 55, 11, he says, my word will not return void. It'll reach all those people he intended to reach. So if it reached you, if this meant something for you today, if this stirred you up today, if you even hate me today, then something happened. You heard the word of God. You heard the unadulterated word of God preached right at you. What you do with it is up to you. But I encourage you to send this out to anyone who needs to hear this message, anyone who's feeling discouraged, anyone who's, who looks around in this world, in this society, and says, what is happening here? All I see is darkness and evil. There is hope. There is hope in Jesus Christ. There is the only hope we have is Jesus Christ. And I pray that everyone who's watching this, whether you're seeing it now live or you're going to watch this on a replay or even 10 years down the road, whenever you see this video, I pray that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. And that you have the gift of eternal life and forgiveness of sins. Because if we can look at the world and we can look at society and we can look at the laws that are made through Jesus' eyes and not our eyes, if we could see the world and society and how we treat one another and so on, the injustices that are happening, and we looked at them through Jesus' eyes, I guarantee you we'd see a whole different world than what we live in right now. We would see instantly all of the things that are wrong if we just look at things through the eyes of Jesus. Bereans, I also, I only covered a couple of verses today, but I want you to go back and read all of Isaiah chapter 5. Read all six woes, and you see that it's even much more than what I was able to preach today. Much more. God has six different woes, and we better be paying attention to all of them. So Bereans, do your homework. Be a diligent Berean. Acts 17, 11 says they heard the word, they received the word, but then they searched the scriptures daily to make sure what they were hearing was true. Daily, every day. The Bible's not a Sunday book. The Bible's not Sunday and Wednesday book. The Bible's an everyday book. And if you're a Christian like I'm a Christian and you're born again, this book is our life. This tells us exactly what we're supposed to be doing, what we're not supposed to be doing. Read the Bible. Study the scriptures. Lastly, I want to thank all of you who have been praying for us, particularly those over the last month. It's been a rough time for this family and for this ministry as we are moving from one uh, area of ministry into another. And because we're doing that, we are, 
We are in a transition right now, and you have no idea how much your prayers mean. I can only say this, and I can post it, and I can thank you all individually. But I thank all of you for the prayers for this ministry, that you have lifted us up. You lift me up so that I can continue preaching, being bold. Please pray that I stay bold and loud and insistent, and that I preach the word of God as God gives it to me that I don't compromise, I don't back up, I don't retreat, I don't quit, I don't walk away because of people not liking me or people not tuning into my channels or people not supporting us. I must preach what God has given me to preach. So thank you for all of your prayers. Continue to lift me up, continue to lift this ministry up. Thank you also to those who have uh, helped us financially over the past month. Again, you have no idea how much that has helped us over the last month because we lost salary. Gone. And so I know God supplies all of our needs. We know that from Philippians 4. But I say a special thank you to all of you, no matter what the amount was that you helped us financially. I will provide our PayPal address if you want. We also have Facebook Messenger you can send something to. If God would lead you to support us, you don't have to. This is not a ministry where you have to pay for prophecy. You don't have to pay for me to pray for you. You don't have to do that. You simply do it if God has led you to support this ministry, if this ministry has blessed you, if it's meant something to you, and you choose to support us. But if not, I want you to make sure that you are subscribed to our YouTube channel. I want you to make sure that you're on Facebook. We're also on Twitter. Make sure you get in touch with me if I can help you with prayer or some kind of counseling. If I can help you in any way, I'm here to help you. So I want to thank you for listening to this. This was a particularly animated uh sermon today. I want to thank you for being here today. Please share out this message. If you haven't subscribed to YouTube yet, please do. If you haven't put a like on the Facebook page, please do. And I will see you again tomorrow night for the next edition of Monday Night Manor. Thanks for being with me and God bless you.